And uh, today we're, we're going to take a look at when Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, was teaching at the temple. When Jesus was teaching at the temple. Now, last week we uh, spent some time looking at the the <laughs> the moment that Jesus cleansed the temple, right, and what took place there, and that was a pretty amazing time. Well, right after that, Jesus actually took some time to do some teachings. And uh, the, this evening, um, as, as we focus on what Jesus was teaching about, uh, he, he basically, uh, he gave a couple parables. He answered a question that I think was meant to trap him. And uh, all of this all four of these moments that we're going to look at here today were moments where I believe that Jesus was trying to deal with the issue of pride. pride. It's June. Uh, pride, okay? Uh, yeah, the original meaning of it, okay? Yeah, not how it's been hijacked, uh, but, but pride. Uh, if we were to look at the uh, definition of pride, and first of all, there are some positive aspects of that word, right? I'm proud of you, for example. You know, we're, we're proud of our kids. We're proud of our friends, proud of the grandkids, um, and, and, and nothing wrong with that. But what we want to do is look at the whole negative aspect of it. And here's a, a definition of pride. It's an excessive love of one's own excellence, and if you don't believe it, they will tell you how incredibly excellent and amazing that they are. Um, there are some that would say, and we're on the second paragraph on the first page of your notes, there are some that would say that the fall of man, when the original sin took place in the Garden of Eden, uh, pride very much came into play as the serpent was, was tempting Eve. Um, in, in Genesis 3, verse 5, the serpent uh, basically went to the newly created humans, and what did he say? He said, you will be like God. Do you remember that? And, and that was the whole... Um, that was the whole temptation. That was the draw. That was the lure, if you will, uh, was that. And, and how, how prideful is it? Does it get any more prideful than trying to be just <laughs> like God? How prideful can that be? I always made a joke in high school. I broke up with my girlfriend we, over religious issues. Well, what was the problem? Well, she thought she was God. And... and uh, uh, wow, thanks. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a great show. Oh, hush. And um, these are the jokes. It's, it's Father's Day this Sunday, so I can do bad dad jokes. Um, but <laughs> ah, I love you. If, uh, look at the screen. If God can, it should be cure our pride. I'm sorry about that. If God can cure our pride, he can treat other sins as well. Uh, Oftentimes, any temptation and any sin that we give into, the underlying draw is that of pride. And, uh, and what is that? It's, it's elevating ourselves. It is fluffing ourselves up to a place that we have no business being in. Remember when I gave you the definition of humility, right? False humility is when we compare ourselves to one another. And that, that can go either way, okay? But true humility, I want to be a humble person. True humility is simply seeing who you are, not compared to others, but who you are compared to Jesus. That's humility. And again, is it any wonder that in 2 Chronicles 7.14, this popular verse that we love to quote regarding God reviving the nation in our, in our church, if my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I will, heal their, uh, I will forgive their sin and heal their 
land. And what's funny, a lot of people say, ooh, let's, let's take that verse to heart. So they start praying and they start repenting. And there's nothing wrong with prayer and there's nothing wrong with repenting. But oftentimes we do it and we, we, we don't really try to humble ourselves. Uh, th- this can really be an issue. And may I also say that this can really, really, really be an issue in the church. Um, I have, I've been in churches or church situations, maybe I visited one, where there developed a, a church hierarchy of the really spiritual people, right? right? And, and, and they were, they were kind of up here, and then everybody else was way down there. And, and wow, you know, our goal was to be like Jesus and be like them, apparently. And I don't believe that God has a religious social class in His church. In fact, look at the end of the second paragraph on your notes. James 4, verses 6 through 8, say, God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So, pride can really take a serious toll on a person's spiritual life, and it's something that we have to conquer. Now, what we're going to do in this chapter, in Matthew 12, we're actually going to look at four interactions that Jesus had, and all four of these, somehow, some way, they kind of deal with the pride issue to a degree. And it says a lot to us as we read these. So we're now at the middle of page one, and I want to take a look at the first interaction that Jesus had in Matthew, oh, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 12. It's this one. Uh, Jesus confronts our prideful rebellion. And, and how, he does that when he tells the story of the parable of the vine growers. Your Bible might have a different title for that story. Uh, Jesus confronts our prideful rebellion. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, why don't you read along with me? This is found in verses 1 through 12 of Mark 12. And uh, here's what it says. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, his son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in your eyes. And then the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him, and they went away. So Jesus tells a really direct story here to illustrate a couple of things. Um, One, as we see in the very bottom uh, paragraph on page one, this parable number one is a story to kind of demonstrate how Israel rejected the prophets that God sent, rejected the messengers that God sent, and then uh, Jesus was also using the story to predict his own death how he, the son, was going to be sent to uh, the world and his life would be taken as well. And so you've got some, uh, you, you got some owners of, or I should say some farmers in, in this vineyard that this farmer, the original farmer, had purchased. 
and they felt instead of sharing the harvest with uh, the, the owner of the vineyards, they beat up or killed every single messenger that came their way. They basically did not have a heart to share what the harvest was. They wanted to keep it all for themselves. Look at this on the screen. We pretend that we deserve and we rightfully possess everything that we have. And I don't believe that that is the case. Uh, at the very bottom, page 1, Romans 1.21, Paul writes, For even though they knew God, and, and Paul here is explaining the lostness of mankind. And it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him uh, as God or give thanks. What that is is pride. That's a form of pride. Um, I, uh, I, I like to tell people, I like to remind people that the Lord made our natural resting uh, position of our hand as an open hand, not as a closed fist. So naturally, we are in a position to give. We, we are not in a position to tightly clench everything that we have. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of Christians in my years now. I've seen some that had a lot of resources, and then I saw some that maybe didn't have a lot of resources. And what was interesting was it wasn't really a matter of how much money that a person had or how much resources they could share to bless the kingdom of God. Really, it wasn't a matter of what was in the wallet. It was a matter of what was in the heart. That made a big difference. That still makes a big difference. If we have this attitude that's up here, if, if we think that we possess everything, this is my stuff. I worked for this. This is all the stuff that belongs to me, my stuff. And we live in a culture that's all about our stuff, right? And, and I've learned that, you know what? Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. It all comes from him. It's his. It's his. I'm, I'm just a steward of what he's given me. And wh when that happens, then my attachment to things, uh, that changes dramatically. Because now I don't feel like that I, I, I'm a steward of what he's given me, but I don't own it. It's his. There's a big difference between being a wise steward of what you've been given and thinking that it's all yours to begin with. Right? And so Jesus tells this really interesting story about this, this mentality, but he doesn't stop there. Uh, in verses 13 through 17, he goes to the second interaction, and that's on the top of page 2. Hmm. Here, Jesus confronts our prideful independence. This is, uh, some of you might re uh, remember this phrase, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. Here's where that phrase comes from. And uh, look at the scriptures here again, starting in verse 13. This is coming up right after he tells this parable, okay? Then it says, later, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus. Th that was another religious group, by the way, religious leaders, um, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Okay, so they're trying to trap Jesus. Let me show you how. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Time out, by the way. Whenever somebody really wants to talk to you, I have learned that it's usually not the first thing that they want to talk about, that they want to talk about. It's the second thing that they bring up, okay? So their purpose in coming to Jesus was that, some of you are looking at me like, really? Trust me, okay? So these guys come to Jesus, and they're just flattering him. You are so great. Oh, your teaching is just so wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Now, and it, it's the now part, that what they really want to get into, and that's what's taking place here. And so here's what they say. They, they said, is it right to pay the poll tax to Caesar? 
or not? Now, what are they trying to do? They're trying to trap him. And look at Jesus. For, well, actually, let, let me go back to that verse. Uh, should they pay the poll tax or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. He goes, why are you trying to trap me? He asked, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. Now, let's pause. How did Jesus know they were trying to trap him? This is actually very interesting. Because consider Jesus' possible options for a response, okay? They say, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? If Jesus would have said no, then Jesus could have been arrested and accused of revolting against the government. If Jesus had said yes, then Jesus would have lost favor with all the Jews because they would have seen him then as being associated with the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people's oppressors, the Romans. So they are very deliberate in asking this question. They're thinking, we got him. We've got him. He's got to answer this. What's he going to say? And every time they tried to trap Jesus, he always had a great answer, and he does it here again. So they brought him the coin, verse, that is verse 16. They brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's? And they were amazed at him. Now, What's, uh, what, what's Jesus kind of hearkening to here? Again, look closer at his answer. Whose inscription is this? Whose image? Capture that word. Whose image is this? They said it was Caesar's. I doubt the coin was that big. Who's? <laughs> it's like a plate. Uh, then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and then give back to God's what is God. Now here... Here's what I like. Uh, here's what I like about this. The things that are God's are the things that bear His likeness and image. Oh, see, see, that's so good. Okay, because what's Jesus doing? Jesus is kind of hearkening back to the creation account in Genesis one. 26, which would have been written by then, which would have been available for them to read. In fact, the Pharisees and the Herodians would have known this scripture by heart. So Jesus purposely uses this word image and is reflecting back to Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to his likeness. Things that bear the image of God need to be given back to God. See, this ties into that parable that he just told, right? Those things that bear the image of God, give it to God. Those things that bear the image of Caesar, give it to Caesar. And they couldn't say anything after that. What a great answer. We are created in what? The image of God. Again, Jesus is not so much worried about what's in your wallet. That'd be a great sermon. What's in your wallet? But he's worried about what's in the heart. Look at this. This is important. We think we're in control of our lives. And we have the right to do what we want. Jesus reminds us that we are not our own. We, we, we've got this mentality now. in our. This is one thing about a, a, a democratic society that can play havoc. I, I love our country, okay? So don't go, you know, Pastor Pell's a communist. I'm not saying that, okay? I love, we're actually a democratic constitutional republic, but anyway, I, it, we, this, all of our rights that we have, correct? Okay? We, we, we kind of let that stuff bleed into our understanding of our walk with God. And the problem is, we might say, well, I've got rights. And then Jesus says, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. So when I surrendered when I surrendered my life to the Lord, if you surrender to somebody, what have you 
done. You have given up your rights to the one you surrender to. When you call somebody your Lord, you are not in charge anymore. The Lord is in charge. That master is in charge. One interesting thing about, about some in this kind of younger generation right now that I've noticed, not every, obviously not everyone, but th- there's a mindset of some people that like, well, I'll work for you, but you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. It doesn't work that way. You know, clean the floor. I don't want to clean the floor. It's your job. I don't like that part. I want to do the fun parts. That, that's wrong, right? But sometimes we do that with God. I've got my rights, so I'm entitled. There's that word. When we, see, when we refuse to acknowledge God, we set ourselves up to think that we are just like Him. If you refuse to acknowledge your boss, then you think you're the boss. If you refuse to acknowledge your master, then you think you're the master. And there are very few things more delusional than an employee or a servant who thinks they are the boss or the master. (laughs) And that translates to our spiritual lives. So I'm not my own. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. And to think that I'm entitled to anything To think that, to think that we follow this goofy theology that Jesus is somehow compelled to do whatever I tell him to do. And by the way, that doesn't play in the rest of the world. You you tell a (laughs) you tell a Christian in the underground church in China that, you know what they'll do? They will laugh at you. They will laugh at you. That is just goofy Western Christianity is what that is. Theology. I won't even call that Christianity. I shouldn't even call it theology. It just, that's what it is. If you can spell that, that's what it is. All right. Here's the third interaction. Got to hurry. Jesus confronts our prideful arrogance. Tell this little interaction is, whose wife is she? <laughs> I've been to some family reunions. But, but uh, whose wife is she? <laughs> Jethro's? Um, look at, <laughs> that was wrong. That was funny though. Uh, look at verses 18 through 27. Here's, an- here's another trap that the religious leaders are trying to set. Now, here, it's a different group of religious leaders, by the way, okay? First, you had the Pharisees, okay? That's one group. Then you got the Herodians. That's another group. Here comes the Sadducees, all right? Boy, a lot of religion and not a whole lot of heart uh, as far as their walk with God. Look at this. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, let me repeat that, The Sadducees say there is no such thing as a resurrection. Are we clear? That's what the scripture says. Here we go. They came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. How many of you thankful those rules don't apply anymore, by the way? Okay. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, n- in fact none of the seven left any children. Jerry, Jerry. Last of all, the woman died too. So at the resurrection, by the way, did I mention that the Sadducees don't even believe in the resurrection? Okay, I just thought I'd make that clear, all right? So at the resurrection, 
whose wife will she be? Since the seven were married to her. It's another trap. And Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Let's just pause there. For Jesus to say, <laughs> for Jesus to say this to the religious ruling class. Okay? Again, the harshest words that Jesus ever had were for the religious leaders. It was never for the sinner. It was never for the prostitute. It was never for the sinner. It was never for the person that was steeped in sin. The harshest things he ever said, like in this case, was to the religious people that were leading people astray. So again, he says, you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you, not, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Mic drop. Every time they try to trap Jesus, and, and so what, what kind of pride are we looking at here? This is kind of an intellectual pride. You ever see that? I know more than you. Oh, oh, oh. Right? It's amazing. I'm not slamming any other college student at all, so please understand this when I say that. But, but when I remember when I was in youth ministry, then I'd get like a kid who had a semester of Bible college come back and try to tell me how to, how to do ministry, I'd be like, oh, sonny boy, you have no idea. And, and, and why? Because they got smart. Right? And it's not just that. You know, it's some people who, they know they're the smartest person in the room. And even when not even believing in the resurrection, they've tried to come up with this hypothetical for Jesus, which is crazy and extreme, in order to try to trap him. And again, we read the Jewish custom there, right? Again, it's explained a little bit more in the middle of page two. In Jewish custom, if a man died without an heir, H-E-I-R, his brother would marry the widow. Any children born to the second husband would be considered the legal heir of the first husband. The technical term for, for this is uh, levirate marriage. In the scenario, this sounds like a reality TV show, actually, doesn't it, right? I'd watch. Uh, in the scenario conceived by the Sadducees, this happens seven times. Seven people have legally been married to the same woman. To whom will she be married to in the resurrection? And so Jesus, once again, brilliantly answers their question. But look at this, when, when, when pride affects our intelligence, it convinces us that we are geniuses and everyone else is inferior. And that's a terrible place to be. And let me just pause here and just say, you may not have, you may be like me and you don't have a master's degree and you don't have a doctorate, for example. Okay, that, that does not mean you are, are an unintelligent person. Uh, I have met a lot of very, very smart idiots. I'm, I'm just telling you. And then I've, let a I've met some unschooled people who were so wise. So wise. So pride will try to come in. And maybe it's not because we have nicer clothes or nicer cars, but, but because, you know, we think we're the smartest in the room, and so we have to let everybody know that. Goodness, I've, I've, I've met people in the ministry that, that do that, and I just kind of sit there and I'm like, mm, wow, you're amazing. And I'm like, you know, whatever. You know, I, I, because honestly, my response is, I, I, I don't care. I don't care what you know. Uh, I want to know Christ. And the power of his resurrection. 
and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming more like him in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, now, that's not, I'm not saying that higher education is wrong, so don't drop out of school, okay? Okay, your pastor said I should. So that's not what I'm saying. Higher education is great. People getting their master's, awesome. People getting their doctorates, great. They get another doctorate, awesome. Happy for you. But what happens in us when we acquire that knowledge? We still need to have humility there. We got a person in here right now, probably the smartest person in the room right now besides me. I'm kidding. Uh, no. Uh, honestly, honestly, Keith Carpenter. Dude has, I know we've said this before. I always forget the number, Keith, because maybe you've come up with more. How many patents do you have now? You don't even know? That's disgusting. Okay, wow. Uh, patents. He has a lot of patents. This man has invented things. This guy is smart, okay? And not an arrogant bone in his body. I love that. I love that. that, that's, that's, that that's that intelligence that has been reined in by a godly humility. That's what that is. Didn't mean to embarrass you, buddy, but uh, I just, I think that's amazing. Um, look, God's reality is bigger, not smaller than our own. So God knows what's most important. God knows what needs to be dealt with. God knows what we need to camp out on. And, and here's what I know. At the very, very, very bottom of page 2, 1 Corinthians 2, nine, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Because if we're not careful, we'll even think that we're a little bit smarter than God. We'll never say it, but we'll act that way with our prayers. We'll act that way with our situations. Uh, and when we have this, in here, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 55, okay? I'm getting the senior right now at the golf course, Stan. It's awesome. So, and, <laughs> and at Golden Corral. It, it, I mean, it's a, it, it's a benchmark time for me. And, and so, <clears throat> uh, the longer I'm doing this, uh, the less I know. The less I know. And I kind of fancy myself as one who loves to learn. You can ask my family. I love to learn brand new things. I, oh, I love that. I love that. In fact, call me weird, but when I was a kid, I'd pray before I went to bed, and then I'd say, God, what did I learn today? I know, we're, but, but I'd think, okay, what did I learn? I learned this. I, God, I figured this, I figured this out, and, and I never stopped learning. But the more and more and more and more I am alive, the more and more and more I realize that God's ways are so much higher than mine. And his ways are so much higher than mine. And I've got all this life experience, and I've got this IQ, and I've got this degree, and I've got this, and I've got that. And really, it just doesn't even compare because my reality is nowhere near God's reality. His ways are higher. All of his ways are higher. Here's the last interaction that Jesus had. This one's kind of good. Uh, Jesus calls us to loving submission. Jesus gets this question, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Now again, we've got 10 of them, right? The 10 commandments. We've also got all these laws and uh, everything that, Ju that the Jewish law has covered for everything and how to dress, how to bury somebody, how to eat, what not to eat, how to build, what to do. We got all of that. But then you've got all of us, so us sports fans, we got the Big Ten, okay? And so, another religious leader, this time a scribe, comes up to Jesus, and here's the account. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus said, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord 
is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. By the way, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Then he continues. The second one is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all our heart, with all our understanding, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Would you? So, and, and by the way, I think I've shared this before. If you were to take the Ten Commandments, okay, the first four, deal with our relationship with God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The last six, deal with our relationship with our fellow man. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's why Jesus can make those two statements. On these two commands hang all the law and all the prophets. I think he said that in Matthew. So again, Jesus is answering so incredibly here. What's our takeaway? Jesus is calling us out of our prideful and our arrogant devotion to ourselves and into his kingdom, which is characterized by the submission of our entire self. God, I give you all. I, I, I give you everything. I, all of me. I surrender all. Remember that hymn? Uh, today's church culture has made it I surrender most. Or I surrender some. And I, I got to give you everything. I surrender it all to you. And with that, I want to give you three takeaways that are on the very bottom of page three, and I want to put them on the screen for you as well, and then we're going to let you go today. First of all, we can't enter the kingdom of God until we are ready to leave our own. We can't enter the kingdom of God until we're ready to leave our own kingdom. We can't exist in two kingdoms. There are no summer homes in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Secondly, I can't put God on the throne of my life until I get off of that throne myself. And then thirdly, uh, I can't serve other people until I stop serving myself. God will take care of you. God will provide for you. Just do what he says. Love God with everything. And love your neighbor, love the people around you like you'd want to be loved yourself. It's no wonder that Jesus says in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added unto you. Hanging on to, to the, all these things, that, that's pride. That, that is not a dependence or reliance on God, not at all, but, but seeking him first, doing his will first, obeying his word first, that, that puts everything in place. Amen? All right, I want to pray for you. Let's have a good rest of the week. Jesus, I love your word. I love you. I thank you, Lord, for, uh, for you and for your word. I pray that we would hide this word that we've heard today in our hearts, that there's just one part that challenges us to be closer or to live more like you. God, I pray that would happen. So, Lord, Go before us today as we go home. I pray that you be glorified by our lives and bring us back to your house this weekend, ready to not only receive from you, but also ready to give of ourselves for you. And Lord, I'll thank you in your name. And we all said amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Online crowd, we love you so much. Thanks for joining us. We will see you later. God bless.